Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Welcome to Big Book Awakening, St. Paul's West End Saturday Morning Women's Big Book Study. Thanks for listening today. As a big book study, the goal of this recording is to increase our collective knowledge of the book, of the book Alcoholics Anonymous by sharing with each other. Let's start by introducing ourselves as speakers. I'm Callie, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm Barb. I'm an alcoholic. So today our chapter is We Agnostics, Chapter 4. Um, <clears throat> and right in the beginning, right the first paragraph, um, it gives us the two questions. We only need two, actually. Um, that we should answer if um, we want to know if we're an alcoholic or not. If when you want to honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. Now, I was reading that AA put out a pamphlet with 10 questions and that there are some um, treatment centers that have assessments that have 42 questions. But the one I liked best was one that came from uh, Wino Joe in Tyler, Texas. <clears throat> and that question was, do you find that the roof of your mouth gets sunburned? <laughs> that was my favorite. So um, anyway, assuming that we can both answer those questions, um, there are two possible outcomes. And that's in the next paragraph. Number one is to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis. And they seem like pretty far out of alternatives, although I think all of us had the experience of being close to being doomed to an alcoholic death, because I don't think we would be here if we hadn't been. Page 45, lack of power, that was our dilemma. Um, And that is our dilemma. Those first two questions um, about alcohol, Um, Our answers to them indicate a total lack of power. So the solution is to find a power by which we can live, and it has to be a power greater than ourselves. Um, And that's that's what this book is about. The, The book is going to tell us how to find that power that is greater than ourselves. Um... I had a lot of experience working step two. It was probably the longest step that I worked just because I did not like the idea of anybody talking to me about um, God or supreme beings or higher powers. Um, You know, I thought it was all all some kind of, um, you know, voodoo stuff. And um, what I've come to find out is that, that the problem of the alcoholic um, and this alcoholic, anyway, <clears throat> was being pretty locked up into a lot of old ideas. And, and that once I opened up enough to lose some of the old ideas, um, I became open to uh, the power greater than myself, which I had to have because I was definitely an alcoholic. Um, okay, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Thanks, Barb. I love that voodoo. That's so funny. Um, So throughout the chapter in general, um, but over the course of these next few pages in particular, the concept of willingness is emphasized repeatedly, kind of like what Barb was just talking about, that openness and willingness. So a couple examples. um, In the first full paragraph on page 46, he writes, uh, we found that as soon as we are able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commence to get results. And then on page 47, there are a few references in the second paragraph. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man or woman can say that he or she does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him or her that they're on their way. Um, so now that that notion of willingness has been established, we can get back to some of these other principles, um, such as the truth that there is no one conception of God. Therefore, we don't need to buy into anyone else's belief. And for me, this sort of worked in reverse, um, because I was raised thinking 
that everyone needed to believe in a certain savior in order to be saved. And this concept of choose your own God just didn't compute for me. Um, it was really, it just turned me off. Um, but over time, I became less concerned with defining or comprehending that power. And those words are taken right out of the book on page 46. And he says that it's impossible to define or comprehend. Um, so I became less concerned with that and more invested in relying upon the power. And once that happened, uh, it didn't matter what other people believed. I was able to respect what other people believed um, and um, just sort of roll with it. Um, and then a side note, we will be revisiting Appendix 2 Spiritual Experience um, at the end of this chapter rather than right now. Um, another idea I'd like to go back to on page 46 is that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek God. Um, there's meditation which references this text I'd like to share quickly. Um, it's from Daily Reflections, and it's um, a reading from June 16th. It's called Open-Mindedness. It says, We have found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. To us, the realm of spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek it is open, we believe, to all men. <clears throat> and that's from As Bill Sees It. Open-mindedness to concepts of a higher power can open doors to the spirit. Often I find the human spirit in various dogmas and faiths. I can be spiritual in the sharing of myself. The sharing of self joins me to the human race and brings me closer to God as I understand God. Um, and I love this reading as it relates to the text because it encourages us to not only be open-minded to God or a higher power, but to other people and sharing ourselves. I'm going to try and adjust my camera because it's super dark. I don't know why. Um, and we'll see how important this sharing of ourselves is. That didn't help. That made it worse. <laughs> we'll see how important uh, the sharing of ourselves is later in the chapter. Um, so moving on to page 48, top of page 48. Um, the first full sentence, I would argue, would be just as accurate funny that I use the word argue because we're talking about arguing um, with the word spiritual removed so we could read it. Many of us have been so touchy that even casual reference to things made us bristle with antagonism. Um, and I read it that way. Uh, that's just my personal um, experience with life um, because um, I, you know, I just like to fight um, everything. And um, for me, um, when I'm in a non-spiritual state of being, I'm ready to fight, argue, contest. And as Bill writes, this sort of thinking had to be abandoned. Um, here at the top of page 48, I'm reading. Um, Faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on other questions. Um, and that brings us again back to that state of willingness. And with that, I will turn it back to Barb. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, some, <clears throat> some of us um, let ourselves get beat up for a longer time than others. Um, so the reader may still ask why he should believe in a power greater than himself. Um, it, it, the answer's in the previous paragraph. If you don't, you're going to die. Um, and, and further, um, when it comes to why questions, I think the only real answer to every why question is the Big Bang. Um, I don't, I don't see that they go, why questions just don't go anywhere for me anymore, although I was pretty full of them early on. Um, <clears throat> he then goes down to describe, um, uh, next few paragraphs, um, he's kind of setting out a, a little Thomistic proof for the existence of God, um, and, uh, that, that scientific method is that, um, um, we can make an assumption <clears throat> of the existence of anything that will explain a certain set of phenomena. And, um, and so, so his, the assumption here is that there, there is a power greater than ourselves. And the way the proof of this power comes through the people that we work with. Um, I did not, I, I, I was totally shut off against any, any notion of, of a power greater than myself. But I got to see that something worked in my sponsor, uh, that something had given her some kind of peace, some kind of serenity that I wanted. So in that sense, I, I think that was where my initial faith came from. 
I was listening to a, uh, an interview with Carl Jung last night, and he was talking about the, the interviewer was asking Jung, do you have faith in, in uh, spiritual um, um, existence, you know, above the finite world? And Carl Jung said, I don't need faith anymore. I, I know. I know it exists. So I thought I thought that was really interesting, and um, I'm just sharing it with you today. And then we um, ending ending my portion of this. Th- this power has, in each case, accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible. No question about that. I, I tried for decades to quit. I tried for decades to control my drinking, and it wasn't until I worked this program that I was relieved of that obsession to use. And I'll pass it back to Callie. Thank you, Barb. Um, So now we're on page 50. Um, The paragraph at the bottom, the final full paragraph. um, So this, uh, before I get into it, um, this section, uh, I would say the themes here are faith and reliance um, and why these things are reasonable. And if you had told me that, when I had gotten into the program um, 10 plus years ago, I would have said that's insane. Um, but Barb's next section will really get into the meat of that. So this, this last full paragraph on the page um, sets us up for how we change our living and thinking, not our drinking. Uh, and I'm just going to read snippets of it. So uh, it reads here, are thousands of men and women, they declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves to take a certain attitude toward that power and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking, leaving aside the drink question. They tell why living was so unsatisfactory. They show how the change came over them. When many hundreds of people are able to say that the consciousness of the presence of God is today, the most important fact of their lives, they present a powerful reason why one should have faith. Um, just a few notes. It does not say um, why one should stop drinking, and it does not say that God is the most important fact of their lives. It says the consciousness of the presence of God. So those are just a few little things I wanted to pull out. Um, and then we we go on to um, Bill just basically imploring us to continue to be open-minded. Um, and this section contains examples of research and invention that were more recent at the time the big book was written, but they're still relevant today, such as the Wright brothers' successful first flight. Uh, then we get into the bedevilments on page 52, which are just a plain and true description of alcoholism, um, untreated alcoholism, the symptoms of untreated alcoholism. And... Right there in the middle, we were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Um, I was just reading some fiction, um, and one of the characters or whatever um, was actually, I feel like every piece of fiction I've picked up lately there's at least one character that's mired in the bedevilments and it's irritating to read almost like I don't, uh, I, I'm not sympathetic with these characters. I feel like I should be, but I'm not <laughs> like, I'm just like, man, I, I'm just so glad I'm not living like that anymore. Um, especially if it's a protagonist, um, and they're just like blindly just barreling forward in their alcoholism. Um, and I can't help but wonder if the author is also an alcoholic. A lot of great writers are, I know. Um, but anyway, Side note. Um, So we return again on page 53 uh, to the themes of faith and reliance. Um, Actually, at the bottom of 52, uh, he says, simple reliance and childish faith. Um, And then toward the middle of 53, uh, Bill starts to get into his case that faith is reasonable, sane, and logical. And I will pass it back to Barb. Uh, So in 53, when we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis. We could not postpone or evade. I didn't realize that my crisis was self-imposed, but I did learn that that's true. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else she is nothing. God either is or she isn't. What was our choice to be? And I think that maybe we have no choice. I think that maybe we come into this program failures at living, and failures at dying. So 
when we are presented with step two, with what are you going to choose? Are you going to accept that there's this higher power that's going to um, that it, that is going to restore you to sanity? I don't. I don't think we have a choice. I, I think eventually we we can fight it, but I think we fall into it. I'm not sure that it was a a choice on my part. My experience with step two. I remember my sponsor arguing with me in a coffee shop about how um, this could be your higher power, that chair could be your higher power, and then she goes, and I could be your higher power. And I went, oh, hell, I'll take God. You know, I mean, um, yeah, that's too much. So what I did was I, I kind of said, okay, for the purposes of the program, there, there's something. And, and, and that was it. And it was not until I got my one-year chip that I really and truly knew in my bones that I did not keep myself sober. So um, arrived at this point, squarely confronted with the question of faith. And and I think that faith is something that we grow into. Um, the Joe and Charlie story about um, you take your car to the, um, you, you move into an, a new town, your car breaks down, you ask your neighbor where you um, can get your car fixed. And he gives you the name of Joe, and you take your, your car over to Joe. And you have hope that Joe is going to fix the car and, and not break you in the process. When when Joe does fix the car and the bill is reasonable, and when the car breaks down again, when you take it back, you're operating on faith because you know that it happened before. So you have every right to expect that it's going to happen again, that it's going to work out. So I think that step two for me was something that I had to grow into over time. Um, on page 55, um, after, after the, the paragraphs on faith, um, actually we were fooling ourselves for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God or higher power or spirit of the universe. I had a problem with the God word. Um, and my sponsor pointed out to me that there are a couple of places in the book where it tells us where to find God. And this is one of them. And I think I'm ready to turn that back to Kelly. Thanks, Barb. So the end of the chapter um, recounts a story that's found in more detail in one of the stories in the big book. And the story is uh, titled Our Southern Friend. Um, this is a story I would highly recommend to anyone who hasn't read it. Uh, in my third edition, it begins on page 497. Um, I think in newer editions, it begins on page 208. <clears throat> Either way, I'm going to read some passages from the story that directly relate to this section of We Agnostics um, and give us a better sense of what we've been talking about today. So, the very first sentence... Um, his father is an Episcopal minister, so that really sets the stage. This guy um, knows what he's talking about as far as <clears throat> religious bias is concerned. And then I'm going to skip to the end of the chapter because the first part is just, you know, his drinking and set, you know, gives a good argument for the fact that he's an alcoholic. So toward the end, um, he writes, I am in the hospital for alcoholics. I am an alcoholic. The insane asylum lies ahead. Could I... Oh, no. Okay. The insane asylum lies ahead. I wish I were dead, as I have often wished before. I am too yellow to kill myself. Four alcoholics play bridge in a smoke-filled room. Anything to get my mind from myself. I start to clean up the debris from a bridge game. One man comes back, closing the door behind him. He asks me if I believe in a power greater than myself, whether I call that power God, Allah, Confucius, prime cause, divine mind, or any other name. I told him that I believe in electricity and other forces of nature, but as for God, if there is one, he has never done anything for me. Then he asks me if I am willing to right all the wrongs I've ever done to anyone, no matter how wrong I thought the others were. Am I willing to be honest with myself about myself and tell someone about myself? And am I willing to think of other people, of their deeds instead of myself, in order to get rid of the drink problem? I'll do anything, I reply. Then all of your troubles are over, says the man, and leaves the room. The man is in bad shape, 
is in bad mental shape, certainly. I pick up a book and try to read, but I cannot concentrate. I get in bed and turn out the light, but I cannot sleep. Suddenly a thought comes, can all the worthwhile people I have known be wrong about God? Then I find myself thinking about myself and a few things that I wanted to forget. Then comes a thought that is like a voice. Who are you to say there is no God? It rings in my head. I can't get rid of it. And we all know how the rest of the story goes. And this paragraph here at the bottom of 55 that begins, we can only clear the ground a bit. Um, This really is a great description of what I was referring to earlier um, when I said, you know, open, when we open ourselves to each other, we open ourselves to a higher power. Um, And the entire paragraph reads, we can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to seek diligently within yourself. Then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway with this attitude. You cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. Um, and I just think that's great, um, because it, one refers to our testimony, helping sweep away prejudice. So that's us helping each other, um, joining us on the broad highway. So that refers to people working with each other. Um, and then that last sentence really, um, goes back to what Barb was saying, um, that deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God, that it already exists. Um, the consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you, which, you know, I interpret as you already believe and it will come to you, which um, at the end of the chapter, the word miracle is used. What has this been a miracle of healing? And that's the way I see it too. Um, what has happened to me? Like Barb said, I didn't do it. Um, it's a miracle. And with that, I think we're going to go ahead and get into the miracle of the spiritual experience. On Appendix 2, Appendix 2 did not um, appear in the first edition. What happened was um, a lot of alcoholics were asking Bill if they were supposed to have the same white light experience that Bill had. So he decided to expand on spiritual experience, spiritual awakening. First few chapters here, they talk about change, personality change, um, or religious experience, um, sudden spectacular upheavals, and um, immediate overwhelming God consciousness. And and this is not how it happens with everybody. It's a little bit further down, they talk about the educational variety. <laughs> we do have to leave ourselves open to be educated a little bit. And... Um, and quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he, he is himself. Um, I finally realized that I had undergone a profound alteration in my reaction to life, and that such a change could hardly have been brought about by myself alone. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. And that's another spot where it tells us where to find this power. I was really surprised that it turned out to be an inner resource for uh, a long part of my sobriety. It was still something out there. Um, And I think what's important about spiritual experience, and I think Carolyn mentioned it at, at, um, at the meeting last week, is is that it is the solution. The spiritual awakening, the spiritual experience is the solution to the problem and that it is guaranteed in step 12. I don't believe that it comes before step 9. I think our conscious contact with the power greater than ourselves comes after the ninth step. And it, it, it does so in the book anywhere. Uh, where it says that we have entered in, into, um, um, we have now entered into a spiritual life. Um, for me, my my spiritual experience, um, my first one came after I did my fifth step, and I went to my brother's funeral, and I was supposed to uh, be giving a, a little eulogy on um, how wonderful the um, Irish saints and scholars and drinkers were. And um, 
I, you know, I had all this stuff in my hand and, and all the poets, you know, quoted and stuff. And, and I looked out and I saw my brother's son and my brother's grandson and, and something broke, something cracked inside. And I did, I started on my complete 180. Um, old stuff started to disappear. Um, and I was able to look out into their eyes and just simply talk about, uh, about the love we shared when we were young. And, and no matter what, comes in between no matter the the divorces and the hurt feelings and all that stuff that that comes as we get older what sticks is the love and and i i do believe that to be true and, and i do believe that that's an important part of the spiritual experience it is to come to see that i had another educational variety in relation to another family member I hated this person. I just couldn't stand her. And and two years ago, I realized I, I did not hate her anymore. I love the woman. I still love the woman. And it was no not a change in her. Well, maybe a little, but it was, it was definitely a change in me. And and these changes are here for the taking in this program. Um, and that's all I got. All right. I'm Kristen. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, We're going to talk about We Agnostics today, which is chapter four in the big book. Um, And I will just go ahead and jump in. So chapter four, We Agnostics. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. That's the first sentence of the chapter. And what it's talking about is that what we've heard so far in the book, besides the the prefaces, is the doctor's opinion, which tells us that what we have is an allergy. Um, Bill's story, which tells his experience for eight pages, and then his what happened and what it's like now for another eight pages. Then there's the chapter called There is a Solution, which um, describes the real alcoholic. Um, Right, just and um, and then the chapter called "More About Alcoholism." Chapter three is where we hear about um, Jim. For example, he's the one I identify with the most. He's he uh, diff- So there's four different ways in chapter three. Um, four different ways that we tried to stop drinking or couldn't figure it out. You know, four. So self knowledge laying off it for 50 years, like all these different ideas that we thought we could try. And so here we are at chapter four. Um, We hope you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope you have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. If, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. Or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably an alcoholic. And I think it's sweet that they say probably (laughs) because they really want us to decide for ourselves that we are alcoholic and they're not trying to boss us around because they they're alcoholics, too. This is a for us by us program where we decide for ourselves. But if that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Um, And I know that this is an illness. So that's um, important to that they're just reiterating that we're not doing this on purpose. This is an allergy. This is something that we need to um, treat as an illness. So this is a radical and confusing idea to have an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer. And that's the point of writing this chapter is like um, thinking about what does this mean to to need a spiritual experience and to have a spiritual experience. So to someone who is in these, you know, who knows what these words means, atheist, agnostic, maybe Kristen can tell us, but, um, yeah, sure. but anyway, people, to some people, this experience seems impossible. 
but at the same time to continue as he as she is means disaster especially if she's an alcoholic of the hopeless variety but actually that's just added on we're all hopeless once we're an alcoholic we are all of the hopeless variety so um I think that that's also just giving us a little wiggle room so we can negotiate our own feelings on the subject. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not easy alternatives to face. This is a very uh, funny statement, really. I mean, um, if we're doomed and death versus live and spiritual and we're trying to work we're struggling with the um, choice is uh, that's actually a theme that comes up throughout the chapter. And, and whenever I see it, I'll bring it out today. It's, it's that we're, we're in this position where we need to be spiritual. We need to grow spiritually because otherwise our only other option is to be doomed to alcoholic death. And there's, There's no middle ground. It's only two choices. And to me, um, just to share a little bit about my experience before I pass it on to Kristen, um, reading this early on, I was able to recognize that that I was already living in a alcoholic death. I was already living in a situation where I was not experiencing my life. I was not enjoying things. I was hiding in the, you know, I was spending as much time as possible in the basement with my bottle of wine. And um, I was purposely missing my kids games so that I, you know, that's like four hours that I could have been drinking. (laughs) I was, so it wasn't a physical death in my mind when I when I hear that I don't think of a physical death although I know this disease kills us literally also but the just having no life having no connection to the world was the kind of death that I was trying to get out of when I came into the rooms I was absolutely miserable I hated everyone and everything and um I could tell you know that's no way to live So, okay, I'm sort of interested. What does this mean to live on a spiritual basis? (laughs) But but this is a little weird too. So luckily there's a whole chapter about it. Um, Go ahead, Kristen. So I'm Kristen, I'm an alcoholic. Another little caveat that I'll say that I don't say it to put anybody off, but I've spent most of my professional life as a Lutheran pastor, like 35 years. I still consider myself an agnostic. So you think about these words, when you put an A in front of it, it means it's not something. Like if you're amoral, you don't have any morals. If music is atonal, it's not you know, a traditional scale. And so an atheism is somebody who believes in God. An atheist is somebody who doesn't believe in God, maybe actively does not believe in God. An agnostic is, gnosis comes from the Greek word, of knowledge. So an agnostic is somebody, I just don't know. I just don't know. Well, and for me, I would say as a person of faith, even, I don't know. I have to take some things on faith. I, I don't know squat. Um, by very definition, I don't know who God is. I don't know anything about God. Um, God is sometimes revealed to me in ways when, and usually I'm like, Oh, oh, why didn't I get that? Um, You know, uh, it sneaks up on me every once in a while. And and for me, a spiritual experience is just something that's bigger than myself, which of course we alcoholics have a hard time entering into anything that's bigger than ourself and the bottle. Um, We are self-absorbed. All we can think about is the next drink. and, and we're totally selfish. So a spiritual experience is just getting out of ourselves. Now, an awful lot of people uh, experience that in nature um, and, and feel that connection to something bigger than ourselves. I'm actually reading a really interesting book about depression, which is really helpful to me, called Lost Connections. And 
oh my gosh, this is a fabulous book. And there's one chapter where he's talking about just for most people, we come close to that kind of spiritual experience in nature because when you're standing on a mountaintop or you're you're out in the middle of an ocean, you realize you are just one little thing and there is something really bigger than ourselves. And whatever that thing is that bigger is than yourself is your higher power. So maybe the ocean is your higher power or a mountain is your higher power or an ant, you know, something that's bigger than you, that you gets you outside of yourself is a spiritual experience. And that's what we desperately need as alcoholics. And, and I would say, he would say that about addiction. He has some really interesting things to say about addiction in another book that it's lost connections. We've, we've just gotten so isolated and like, like Carolyn in her basement with her bottle and you don't have connections that's the spiritual illness, that's the disease. And that connections are a way of um, battling that. And the, the best connection is with our higher power. It's always strikes me as in the many groups and treatments that I've been through to say how many people have a hard time imagining that there's a higher power. And I think that's part of the disease is that, um, well, we're not sure about it, so we can't believe in it, and that's an agnostic. But that's also the basis of faith. You know, you kind of have to take that leap and believe in something that's bigger than yourself. And so, so it is a spiritual problem. And he goes on to talk about, you know, at the bottom of the page, if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy would have was the answer, We'd, we would have solved this a long time ago. This is not a moral failing. And um, a very important person in my life just can't kind of get over that. This is a moral failing. You know, I'm the big sinner because <laughs> I can't conquer this by myself. Well, um, we open every worship, I'm sorry, but we open every worship service in the church that I've served with the thing saying, I cannot do this by myself. I'm a sinner. Okay. I'm, I need something bigger than myself. But this book will also say it's not a moral failing. It's not a matter of having a different worldview. Um, it's, it's having that experience. And as you get to the second paragraph, a power greater than ourselves, the thing in italics, right? That's so important in this book, something, anything that's a power greater than ourselves. And, um, so for me, that's, uh, that's what it is to have a spiritual experience is recognizing there's something bigger than me. Um, there's something that has more power than me or is so more even magical than me. Um, you can have that feeling if you hold a newborn baby, you, you have that, there, there are times, whatever it is for you, maybe it's when you baked a loaf of bread and you just can't believe this miracle thing happened, you know, with yeast, I, what, whatever it is. That's your higher power. And you need to connect with that with all your heart. And, and that's the solution. That's the spiritual experience. Um, so whether we call that God, and, and he goes on to talk about uh, some of us at the bottom of the page, some of us are violently anti-religious. You know, uh, we've had bad experiences with an institution that tries to manage our spiritual experiences. And some of those institutions do it well by supporting us and giving us resources and encouraging us. And some do not do that very well. Um, and so trying to find whatever group it is, again, making a connection, whether that's a church, maybe it's not a church, maybe it's an AA meeting. You know, that becomes your church. I don't think AA meetings are a lot like church. I mean, we used to pass the basket. You had a little confession. <laughs> then somebody gives you the good news. I mean, it's a lot like church, really. Um, wherever you find that ritual that strengthens you, um, that that's really what religion is, is trying to find someplace that strengthens your spiritual experience and encourages you in that, that way. Again, some places do it better than others. But, you know, I say to people, so you had a bad experience with 
different vegetable. <laughs> I, I think that for spiritual experiences, okay, that one didn't work for you. Find one that works for you. And for many, 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 many of us, that spiritual experience is the connection here in this group of fellow alcoholics. And uh, again, that connection that's so healing. Um, so Carolyn, I'm gonna shut up for a little bit here because that's, maybe that's the end of my sermon. I... <laughs> I'm Carolyn, alcoholic. Um, it's so interesting to hear uh, such a Christian person talking. I, I was not a Christian and, um, and so these, some of these words and the ideas are, are funny to me, but I really connect with the idea of, um, of baking bread and being amazed at the miracle and saying that's a higher, you know, to me, higher power is in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, later on in this chapter, it talks about electrons and, and that really drew me in because electrons are a higher power to me. Like what the heck? And they're so tiny and they whirl around and they make solid things. Like, what is that? That's craziness. And, um, you know, clearly I did not do that. Although I am very powerful and very important, I did not create electrons. And I know that. And so that helps me, you know, all of these different versions of connection. Kristen, I think that was really helpful. So, it talks on pages 46 and into 47 that, um, like Kristen was just saying, that we have these, these ideas, these prejudices, like, you know, I didn't like that vegetable, so I hate all vegetables. Um, but it's um, asking us to think about, are we willing? And that's why it talked about at the very beginning of the chapter, are we choosing death or are we choosing to try to be willing? Like that's, what, that's what we're faced with is we either have alcoholic death or we have the option to be willing and so we're going to try to explore being willing so on page 47 we needed to ask ourselves but one short question do i now believe or am i even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself and then it jumps at the end of that paragraph to the spiritual appendix um that little asterisk and I really like the spiritual appendix. Um, so I'll jump over there. It's talking about um, the terms spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. And the reason they made this spiritual appendix, it wasn't in the very first version of the big book. It was in, I think, the second printing of the first version. I'm sure Barb can tell us. Um, but to me, it's an amend. They, they put out this book. They meant to do well. And then they heard back, like, wait a minute, you have to have a flash of light from God to get a spiritual experience? Like, that's no good. Because they do tell some stories like that, even in this chapter, even in our We Agnostics chapter. But here in the spiritual experience, it says, no, we, we, we're we sorry. We didn't mean to make that, um, give you that impression. So it's it's an example of how do you make something right when you've done it wrong? You, you can put in an asterisk, make an appendix clarify yourself um you don't have to be permanently wrong or defend your wrong position so in the spiritual appendix it talks about um this slow profound alteration in my reaction to life it develops slowly over a period of time and and other people might recognize it in me before i recognize it in myself but I'll tell you, the fact that I'm not in the basement drinking Pinot Grigio is a change in my reaction to life because that was my reaction to life. Definitely all, re all things require me to go in the basement and drink, uh, drink that wine. Or, you know, I could go to like a patio and drink it, but like all things require drinking. And so the fact that I'm not doing that and I have no interest in doing that is a profound alteration in my reaction to life. 
And then it, it's telling us that we have an unsuspected inner resource. And I really like that too, because um, one of my favorite genres is, um, oh, what's that called? Like magical fiction. Like, you know, in uh, Like Water for Chocolate, um, that's part of the genre. Or even Harry Potter. Fantasy? They, well, fantasy, so fantasy, yeah. But then there's, um, Like Water for Chocolate is a is a kind of fiction where it's like 98% regular life and then there's like magic in there a little bit. And I, I feel like that's real and that's what happens. And um, I do have, I was born with a superpower you are too. And, and this is telling me your super, you have a superpower and it's in you and you just need to dig it out from under all that dried up layers of manure. <laughs> it's there. Um, or in like Harry Potter, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but some of the people aren't from magical families. And so they have this magical ability, but they don't know what it is. And then they like go around doing you know, making glass disappear without even understanding why or how. And I think for us as alcoholics, like we have this special um, need to connect that we take it to an extreme and try to connect through alcohol, but um, we're a special crew. And that's part of why I really like coming to these meetings is we, we have some, some, uh, superpowers and then it ends this um, spiritual appendix by talking about um, again the only way we can fail is if we completely refuse to be willing <laughs> and um, proof against all arguments cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance and that the principle is contempt prior to investigation and I absolutely had, I had only contempt for everything. So certainly contempt prior to investigation. So I, I really found this chapter um, very eye-opening when I first read it because I didn't realize how much I was blocking myself from connecting. Okay, I'm gonna jump back to page uh, 47. So after we read the spiritual appendix and discovered the only thing that can stop us is an unwillingness to try, this was great news to us. We had assumed that we could not make use of spiritual principles unless we accepted things on faith, um, but we could commence at a simpler level. Besides the seeming inability to accept much on faith, we often found ourselves handicapped by obstinacy sensitiveness and unreasoning prejudice this this cracks me up because it's calling me out so clearly <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I am right and you and I'll tell you why but um and the world would be such a better place if we all thought the way you did I know come on <laughs> but look faced with alcoholic destruction mm, yes I was faced with alcoholic destruction we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on other questions. It finally beat us into a state of reasonableness. We have to be beaten. That's an explanation for like, why does God make this so hard when we're, you know, it's, we're trying, <laughs> we're being beaten into a state of reasonableness. And as soon as we get to become willing and reasonable, then we'll stop being beaten so hard. <laughs> This is a tedious process. We hope no one will be as prejudiced for as long as some of us were. I'll pass to you, Kristen. Okay. So the middle of page 48, the reader may still ask why he should believe in the power higher than himself. We think there are good reasons. Let us look at some of them. And then goes on to talk about kind of, uh, I, I think what our problem is in Western culture we look at world, the world in, with, through scientific lenses. And it's true if you can replicate it in a lab. But if you can't replicate something in a lab, it's not really true. So if I can't prove it, 
and prove that it's true, then it's not true. And that's a particular way of looking at the world. It's a very Western way of looking at the world. And, and I think that's where an awful lot of people are drawn to Eastern religions because it, they look at the world differently. Um, even between Christianity, Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity, Eastern Orthodox, they have a much higher sense of the work of the spirit. And so it, their Christianity is different. In fact, it caused a split in the year 1000 because of how they understood the spirit and how it was expressed in one of the creeds. And so they fought over, they fought wars over that. <laughs> I had to write a five page paper about one little Latin word, filioque, the spirit and the spirit, um, because that divided the church in the year 1000, about how you understand that. And so our Western way of thinking is, I think through the lens of science and yet many great scientists, including Einstein said the world wasn't worth looking at if you didn't look at it with faith. Now, I, I was trying to find my quote from him and I couldn't, I, for all of you out there who are also technolog technologically challenged, I've saved it somewhere on my computer but I couldn't access it that quickly this morning. But, but even Einstein felt that, uh, and many great scientists are drawn to faith because of what they believe to be true, but cannot see and cannot prove. Um, and so I think, uh, in fact, well, so when I was in college, I had this wonderful experience where uh, George Wald, Nobel Prize winning scientist, he won a Nobel Prize for making the connection between vitamin A and eyesight. And you know, what happens in the rods and cones of your eyes because of vitamin A. And Harvard biologist who came to the college that I was at and gave some lectures. And for 45 minutes, he would give this lecture on biology. And I was not a biology major, but that you could understand. And the last 15 minutes were a sermon where he re reflected on what he saw in the mystery of all of that, that told him something about God. Uh, the, one of the authors I really love, who in fact, I just reread one of her books is Annie Dillard. If anybody's familiar with Annie Dillard, she looks in her book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. She, she explores kind of biologically and scientifically the creek behind her house and then thinks, what does this tell me about my higher power, about God, about the creator? What kind of creator is this that makes the world this way with this kind of complexity and, and abundance and death. And it's just, a, I, I just reread the book again. I just find it fascinating, but it's looking at that world through a scientific lens. And I think that's what this book is saying. Everybody believes some things, you know, without a doubt, like electricity or electrons as Carolyn is fascinated by, you know, um, and sometimes that gets in the way of our believing. Um, so I'd like to think of um, the way of looking at the world that way is like looking through prose. And I think faith and spiritual experiences are more like poetry that get at things kind of sideways. And I, that's helped me kind of think about, it's another way of looking at the world that allows me to be open to a higher power. Um, and so they go on to talk about these things we can't see. This a steel girder is a mass of electrons whirling around. Well, we, we believe in that kind of because scientists have told us to believe in that, but I, th that seems weird to me, you know? Um, and so trying to open ourselves up to those things that we can't see, but yet believe in. So at the beginning of, or in the middle of 49, instead of regarding ourselves as intellectual agents, spearheads of God's ever advancing creation, we agnostics and atheists choose to believe that our human intelligence was the last word, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end of all. Kind of vain of us, isn't it? You know, we think we can understand it all. No, we can't, we don't. Um, so, uh, so goes on to say, we who have traveled this dubious path beg you to lay aside prejudice against organized religion, even against organized religion. We have learned that whatever the human frailties of various faiths may be, 
those faiths have given purpose and direction to millions. And I think of that in a way as AA, if you think of AA as our church, has given direction and purpose to millions and help millions of people find health and wholeness and life away from alcohol and addiction. And to put our trust again in that connection and that community, and it's taking a leap of faith. One of my favorite examples of that in the movie is um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And if you watch that, at the end, he's trying to get across this chasm to find the place where the Holy Grail is. And he has to step out into midair and then the bridge appears. But he has to step out and put his weight and foot on something that looks like nothing in order for something to be there. And I think that's a wonderful metaphor for what it takes for us. And even as alcoholics, we have to trust that there's something out there that's gonna help us. And you have to put your whole weight into it and you'll find out it will hold you up. You'll find out, and that's what a spirit, that's what a faith is, faith in anything, faith in another person, in a relationship. You have to dive in and try it. And then you'll find out whether it holds you or not. And so that's really hard for us when we want to be sure and certain and have it proven to us first. Uh, and that's the challenge for atheists and agnostics is trying to say, but I don't want to believe in something other than myself and the thing that's giving me comfort right now, even though it's making me sick. And so to take that really, literally, it's a leap of faith that Indiana Jones takes and well, lo and behold, there's the bridge. So um, that's part of what we have to do also is to have faith in the witness that we have of our fellow alcoholics to say, this worked for me. Well, you know, if it worked for you, Maybe I should try that uh, and have faith in you. Maybe you're my higher power. Um, but to get ourselves again out, out of ourselves and out of our own heads where we're so sure we've got it all, you know, we're the Alpha and the Omega. And if the world would just think like me, well, frankly, it'd go to hell. But I sure wish it would think like me. <laughs> I'm going to pass it back to Carolyn. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I am struck by page 48. The reader may still ask why he should, she should believe in the power greater than herself. We think there are some good reasons. And then it jumps to, all right, I'm jumping. Um, people of faith have a logical idea of what life is about. They're demonstrating a degree of stability, happiness, and usefulness, which we should have sought ourselves. We, I mean, I want to be stable, happy, and useful. That sounds great. Um, let's look at the record. Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. That's us, us, us alcoholics. Thousands of alcoholics, worldly indeed, who say this has worked for them. So there's, a, there's something. Um, we alcoholics have set, say that having this doing this work, having this faith, following this, what's written in the book has led us to a revolutionary change in our way of living and thinking. I'm at the bottom of page 50. It has brought a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowing into us. It's such a wonderful promise. Like, why would you, why would you not want to do that? Um, and then uh, on page 52, still, so it's actually quite a long section in this chapter about why we should have faith. Um, on page 52, it has the bedevilments, which I will read because it's saying, well, we had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems the same readiness to change our point of view. We were having trouble with our personal relationships we couldn't control our emotional natures. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Why should we try to have faith? Because wasn't not a basic solution of these devilments more important 
then are clinging to this like tight little idea that no, there's no God. Like, don't we want to solve those problems? <laughs> are we not trapped in the basement with wine? Like, come <laughs> on, get out. You know, do you want to get better or not? That's the question at the beginning of the of the chapter. If you want to go die an alcoholic death, you know, you'll be joining plenty of people. It's fine. Go ahead. We'll miss you, but you can do that. That's fine. Or you can try this. Um, and so, okay, now that they've spent like four pages talking about why we should do this. So then what? Okay, why? Uh, arrived at this point, page 53. Uh, in the middle of page 53, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith. We couldn't duck the issue. So what are we, what are we gonna do? now that we have decided, okay, fine. Um, and it talks about what I decided is actually a Ruby slipper moment where it, it's saying, we've, you've always had what you needed. Without knowing it, at the very bottom of page 53, without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? Are you not sitting in an AA meeting? reading a book, listening to a group of people, like you have had some faith that brought you here. You know, there, you don't, I've already taken a bunch of steps out of the basement to even be reading this book, right? I, I do have faith. I, I'm just not recognizing that what I'm doing is faith. I'm listening and trying to gain from the, from the group of drunks. And so the Ruby Slippers say, and also, had I not already been worshiping things, I'd been worshiping my Pinot Grigio in my basement room. Exactly. <laughs> I, I remember having someone in a treatment once come in and say, what's your problem with a higher power? Of course you have a higher power. Your higher power is your addiction, is your alcohol. Of course you yeah. don't have a higher power. It's just a crappy higher power. It's like, you know, it, attach you yourself the wrong to one. a church that abuses you. Like, don't stop, you know? <laughs> doesn't mean all higher powers are bad um and so actually when i think that i don't have anything i can believe in anything i worship anything i have faith in that is page 55 actually we were fooling ourselves that is self-deception and that is core to this whole thing is that i constantly self-deceive because I think I'm the most important idea creator and whatever idea pops in my head, I believe it and I deceive myself. But the great reality deep down within us is that I can have faith. There is a world outside um, bigger than me and I can tap it. It's magical realism. Um, you know, it's there. I am magic. I do have superpowers. I just have to figure out how to tap them and move them in a direction that's going to make me happy and joyous and free <laughs> and not trapped in my basement. So in the end of the chapter, and we should wrap it up, actually. Um, even so has God restored us to our right minds. God will come to all who honestly seek him. Um, and like Kristen said, when we draw near, God discloses herself to us. Yeah. I think God is always trying to tap us on the shoulder and get our attention. We just have to pay attention. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.